Uh, so uh, let's begin in the usual way. Uh, first, let's just briefly adjust our motivation, thinking that the purpose of my life is to benefit all sinning beings. And in order that I may be able to benefit sinning beings in the most effective way, I must first achieve the state of highest enlightenment. Then and only then will I have the skills, the qualities, the ability to uh, lead sinning beings in the most effective way from the oceans of samsaric suffering to the state of complete enlightenment. And therefore, I need to learn about all the various practices that lead to enlightenment. And therefore, I'm going to participate in this lecture on the profound stages of the path to enlightenment today. Okay, and now let's just do the usual. Uh, taking refuge in generating bodhicitta. So we can also think that here uh, we're also uh, surrounded by all sinning beings. And in front of us is our guru in the aspect of Shakyamuni Buddha. And then uh, remembering the qualities of the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha and aspiring to attain those qualities. Uh, then we will go for refuge in the three jewels. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha Dharma and Supreme Assembly by my merits of listening to the Dharma may I become a Buddha to benefit transmigratory beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha Dharma and Supreme Assembly by my merits of listening to the Dharma may I become a Buddha to benefit transmigratory beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha Dharma and Supreme Assembly by my merits of listening to the Dharma may I become a Buddha to benefit transmigratory beings. Okay, so uh, we have a lot to cover today. So we're just going to uh, jump right into it because uh, I do also want to make sure that uh, we have time at the end for your questions, which have been, uh, you know, uh, very wonderful. So let's just uh, jump in. Okay. Oops. It always does this when I start on reading mode. Okay. Here we go. All right. So uh, by now, uh, in the last session, we went through and we finished uh, the first sub outline of uh, this main outline number two, developing believing faith in the law of cause and effect, the root of all health and happiness. And so last time we finished the first thinking about cause and effect in general. And now uh, in this session, we're going to go through B and C. So thinking about some of the specifics and after thinking about these things, the way to modify your behavior. So then in uh, thinking about some of the specifics, then it is talking about the ripened qualities Right, so there's eight uh, ripened uh, qualities of a uh, sort of a particularly good rebirth uh, within samsara, and then uh, you know the functions or the benefits of those ripened qualities, and then uh, the causes for achieving those ripened qualities. So uh, these uh, ripened qualities then are, are having a long life, having a handsome body, having a high family, having great wealth, having trustworthy speech. Uh, having great power and fame, being a male, and being uh, strong in mind and body. So uh, I think in this uh, presentation in the Liberation of the Palm of Your Hand, it was pretty, um, you know, uh, easy to understand. Uh, but just to kind of drive home the point, right, because some people can have the doubt oh, well, we're supposed to sort of give up the uh, eight worldly concerns. And so what is all this talk about having wealth, having, uh, you know, being good looking, having power and fame? Aren't some of these the things that we're trying to um, sort of issue, right? Abandon uh, as we try to abandon the uh, eight worldly concerns. So what do we think? Here again, we have to uh, keep in mind that Remember, even having wealth, even being good looking, uh, any of these things, right? It all depends on one's motivation. 
And so with a uh, bodhisattva motivation, uh, you know, to have these things, um, there you can see when it talks about the function of these ripened qualities, you know, if one were a bodhisattva and one had all of those uh, eight qualities, one could see how uh, that would uh, help one be, uh, you know, more beneficial uh, in the world. And um, especially when we look at the, the uh, events in the world right now, uh, well, it probably is just, uh, you know, one person, uh, Xi Jinping, the uh, premier of China, that uh, could have the power uh, to stop the war that's going on right now. Hmm? What do you think? So if one has the great power and fame, trustworthy speech, trustworthy speech that others kind of listen to what you say, the great power and fame to, you know, uh, do good in the world, uh, one could uh, benefit sending beings a tremendous amount. So uh, it all uh, sorts of, sort of depends on our uh, motivation. Uh, okay. So in any case, um, the other thing that's a little bit uh, controversial is this number seven being a male. Um, but uh, when you look in the, the presentation, so first of all, uh, it's important to understand that uh, these qualities in and of themselves, it is also uh, dependent on rising. So uh, depending on the uh, sort of um, society at that time, then um, these things uh, could be more or less useful. Historically, you know, and when it talks about being a male, it says here, the, the function of that, the purpose of that is being a male means that you will not be afraid in a crowd and that uh, when you live in deserted places, you will have few hindrances and interferences in practicing Dharma and so on. So uh, historically speaking, uh, then, um, yeah, uh, up until very recently, and even today in some parts of the world, uh, you know, uh, females traveling alone would have uh, a lot of danger of uh, being attacked, of being uh, raped and uh, killed. So um, this is uh, sort of uh, what that means. Um, I mean, even, even in uh, modern, uh, quote unquote, modern India, uh, we hear of, of, of stories of, you know, women um, who just going home at night uh, have, have been uh, raped, uh, attacked, killed. So, um, yeah, it's not to, to mean there's something inherently, uh, you know, wrong uh, with uh, being a female, uh, but just in uh, those kinds of instances, you can see um, how in terms of practicing a dharma, when, when you think of living in a remote place, living in a cave uh, alone, uh, not being within earshot of someone else, uh, how you know that could lead to an obstacle. Okay. So uh, in any case, then, uh, yeah, I think all of this is pretty self-explanatory. <clears throat> it then goes to the causes of achieving uh, these uh, ripe inequalities. So, yeah, I think that's pretty good. Were there any questions on, on these? I'm, I'm, I'm just taking it for granted. You uh, all did the reading. Hmm? So, yeah, I think there are uh, more important things to do. Just previewing, I'm hoping in this session to go through a commentary on both the 35 Buddhist practice and also the Vajrasava practice. Uh, because this Saturday, uh, we're going to do a sort of a retreat uh, incorporating those two practices. And then next Tuesday, wow, next Tuesday already, I'm, I won't be in Hawaii anymore. Oh. <laughs> but I will be with some of you in the uh, you know, wonderful uh, center in Campbell, Northern California. So I very much uh, look forward to that. As much as uh, leaving Hawaii will, will pain me. <laughs> okay. All right, so let's move on. So then the, the next um, uh, outline is then uh, number three, right? After thinking about these things, the way to modify your behavior. 
And then here there are two, the general teaching, and uh, number two, in particular, how to purify oneself with the four powers. So you'll notice in the uh, first outline, the general teaching, this quote, quotation, uh, which I mentioned at the, I think, in the very first uh, lecture uh, on, on, in this module, uh, recorded this. So these two verses from uh, Shantideva are found in the Liberation of the Palm of Your Hand, as well as Lamim Chenmo. And then I also looked in the uh, Essence of Superfine Gold um, commentary, also on Lamim, and these two uh, stanzas are also there. So uh, this is really the, the point. Now, after having learned about the, um, uh, the kind of conception of karma, now it's up to us to uh, sort of, uh, you know, at all times, day and night, uh, be guarding our behavior and uh, watching our minds, watching our activities, uh, so that we uh, make our behavior uh, in line with the law of karma. And as we have uh, you know, mentioned, uh, you know, the stanza from the Dhammapada, do not commit a single negative action, accumulate a host of perfect pure actions, right? To thoroughly subdue one's own mind, this is the teaching of the Buddha. The whole essence behind all of that is because uh, there is this notion of cause and effect, and, you know, the cause of our, uh, no, non, non, sorry, the cause of our suffering is the non-virtue, then we have to uh, abandon non-virtue as much as we can. And similarly, since the cause of our happiness, even within samsara, is our virtuous actions, then we have to accumulate as many virtuous actions as we can. And that essentially is the uh, practice of the uh, so-called uh, person of initial capability or the, the small scope. Right? Okay. But now, we have had uh, this second stanza, right? Oops. Hold on. The second stanza. Okay. How are we gaining uh, conviction of this? So I brought it up to you um, uh, as a kind of doubt. And then Anne, in one of the uh, earlier um, uh, sessions, also was asking about, uh, you know, how we actually uh, come to realize these uh, things about karma. And so as I was looking in the in, you know, just reading Lam Rim this week, I was reading this uh, Essence of Refined Gold uh, written by the uh, third Dalai Lama, Sonam Gyatso. And so there, <laughs> he agrees with you. He says, uh, you know, to prove the laws of karma solely by means of the force of logic is an extremely difficult and lengthy process. And only a person well-versed in logical reasoning could even follow the process. Hmm? So instead, right, I will quote a verse from the King of Absorption Sutra. So this is also uh, more commonly translated as the King of Concentration Sutra, the Samadhi Raja Sutra, where there he says, the, the moon, moons and stars may fall to the earth, mountains and valleys may crumble, and even the sky may disappear. But you, O Buddha, speak nothing false. So, then, um, okay, uh, there's this book I have here, The Path to Enlightenment. This is a little bit older um, version. I think Snow Lion has republished it under a new title, maybe. But it is a commentary by His Holiness Dalai Lama on this uh, essence of refined gold. And there, it was very interesting to me because we sort of, um, we have this doubt, right? We all know the doubt, all this stuff about karma. You know, we had said before that it is a, uh, you know, extremely hidden phenomena uh, means uh, we have to sort of uh, take the Buddha's word for it, right? On the other hand, we have this uh, general advice from the Buddha uh, to, you know, analyze uh, like a goldsmith purchasing gold and to, you know, just like a, a goldsmith um, will purchase the gold only upon cutting it, rubbing it, and scorching it. So too, uh, you uh, scholars and monks uh, should adopt my words 
only after thorough analysis and not out of mere respect for me, right? We see that uh, advice from the Buddha in the sutra, right? So on the one hand, uh, we have this advice to, you know, use analysis, use logical reasoning. On the other hand, we have this, oh, wait a minute, but karma, it's so subtle and profound. Uh, yeah, just, just trust the Buddha on this because he doesn't speak anything false, right? We see the kind of tension there, right? So, um, His Holiness, uh, you know, the sort of, uh, you know, supreme of all teachers in this world, uh, actually, universe, okay? Then um, he, of course, uh, you know, is aware of this. And, uh, you know, how he talks about it is, you know, on the one hand, okay, uh, we have the Four Noble Truths and how he often uh, emphasizes, right, in, in his talks about being 21st century Buddhist is, you know, the need to use uh, analysis and reasoning and not just merely rely on faith alone. And so uh, he says for a more um, sort of intellectual, uh, intellectually uh, kind of sharp crowd, he likes to uh, start with the teachings on uh, emptiness first, right? Um, and he quotes, you know, the, the Abhisamaya Alamkara, right? I mentioned this to you before, right? Abhisamaya Alamkara, written by whom? Maitreya. Yes, it's on the tip of your tongue. And that is a commentary on the hidden meaning of the Prajapadamita Sutras. So in there, there's a, there's a verse in the first chapter where it says, Drupdan Dempa Nam Dan Ni Sange La Chok Kunshok Sum. Okay. So Drup is the two truths. Denpa means the four truths. You know, nam dan ni. Sange la cho kun chok sum. So sange, you might know, Buddha. La so is like sange, etc. Kun chok sum. Kun chok sum, the three jewels. Okay. So he often says, right, the, the, the kind of uh, real um, way to introduce the Buddhist teachings to a uh, sort of uh, intellectually a sharper audience is to first by you know introducing the two truths right uh, conventional truth and ultimate truth and then do the four truths right uh, truth of suffering truth of the cause of suffering uh, truth of cessation and truth of the path leading to cessation and then go on to the uh, four uh, noble truths sorry the three <laughs> jewels of refuge right because the whole reason why the three jewels of refuge are uh, suitable uh, sources of refuge is that uh, they, uh, the Buddha uh, in particular, taught the four noble truths. Okay. All right. You got that? Okay. You got that, right? So, first, two truths, then four truths, then the uh, three jewels of refuge. But in Lamrim, what do we do? Lamrim, we have the uh, three scopes. And what is the order of the three scopes, right? Where, where, where do those, you know, topics come up? Okay. The three jewels comes up in the small scope. The four truths comes up in the middle scope. And the two truths comes up in the great scope. So it's completely reversed. And then in particular, in the four truths, actually, the, the truth of suffering and the truth of the cause of suffering. Um, now, all these teachings on karma, it is those first two truths, right? We learn about, um, uh, you know, karma being the truth of suffering, sorry, the truth of the cause of suffering. And from those uh, negative karmas come these various types of suffering, the, uh, you know, environmental effect, the uh, ripening effect, all those things, those are in, included in true suffering. Okay. So what do we do? Okay, you all understand the, the, the tension there, right? So what His Holiness says is, right? Here, I'm, I'm quoting from his commentary. This is called The Path to Enlightenment. Uh, he says, right? Um, so the four ordinary persons will be able to feel inclined to rely upon the scriptures. They must first gain respect for the enlightened one. Right. So now he see here, um, 
we're just saying, oh yes, uh, trust the Buddha because he doesn't speak any false words. Then the question should be for us, well, well, why should why should we trust him? I don't know that he doesn't speak anything false, right? I'm not going to just take your word for it, okay? So they must be uh, open. They must be able to open themselves to the teachings. So how do they do this? This respect can be generated in some beings by meditating upon the qualities and characteristics of the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Okay, so uh, we haven't done yet, but when we go through the uh, section on refuge in the Lamrim, you know, it talks about the qualities of the Buddha. It talks about how you know he radiates, uh, you know, light. How his you know eyes are beautiful. His eyelashes are beautiful. How his you know a hair. Uh, you know, is, is uh, curled and all this stuff, right? So it talks about the beauty of his body, okay? But a superior method is to first study the teachings on the two levels of reality, ultimate and conventional, with emphasis upon the subject of emptiness. The doctrine of emptiness is both vast and profound, and an understanding of it gives one greater confidence in the general teachings. In this context, Lama Tsongkhapa wrote, insight into the teachings on relativity enhances appreciation for all Buddha's works. Hmm. So this is sort of, uh, I, I had mentioned this before when I, I talked in uh, relation to the um, uh, Pramanavartika, the uh, teaching on a logic by the great Indian master Dharmakirti, where you know in the, the second uh, chapter, uh, establishing the sort of validity of the Buddha as a source of refuge. Uh, you know, basically, the, the Buddha is a valid source of refuge because he taught the Four Noble Truths. And so then in the Four Noble Truths, we have, you know, for the, the, the second two, the truth of uh, the cessation of suffering and the truth of the path leading to the cessation of suffering, we actually, to understand those two well, we need to understand emptiness because, uh, you know, uh, without understanding emptiness, then we can't understand that the uh, sort of root of samsara, right, uh, which is the grasping to true existence, how that then can be abandoned. If we don't understand that that can be abandoned, it's hard to know about the third truth, the truth of cessation, right? And then to know about there being, uh, you know, a, um, uh, you know, that mind can be abandoned, then we have to know also about the, the fourth truth, the truth of the path leading to cessation, means the wisdom that directly realized, realizes emptiness is the one that can uh, allow us, enable us to abandon the uh, root of samsara. You got it? So for us, what does that mean? His Holiness is emphasizing. Hmm? That uh, you know, by studying the the two truths and especially about emptiness, then we can uh, have greater uh, sort of appreciation for all of the Buddha's teachings. And then uh, when we uh, come to these uh, teachings, they're actually uh, you know more profound in the sense of being uh, extremely hidden, right? Whereas uh, as, as I mentioned, you know, the teachings on emptiness, emptiness itself is only a slightly hidden phenomena. Means Remember the, what those distinctions are? Yes, wow. Okay, maybe some people are new in this, uh, in this module, but a, a slightly hidden phenomenon is one that has to be, that can be realized through an inference from power of the fact. Whereas an extremely hidden phenomenon is one that has to be realized using a, an, an inference by belief. So the inference by belief is basically, a, well, because the, the Buddha said so, and the Buddha is a valid being. He, you know, doesn't speak anything false, just like this uh, King of Absorption Sutra is saying, right? Whereas the slightly hidden phenomena can be realized just from, you know, identifying uh, some, you know, some fact about the essence of the phenomena that we're trying to analyze, right? So when we try to analyze a sprout, right? A sprout, a seed sprout. A sprout and saying, oh, this, the, the sprout is empty of inherent existence because of being a dependent arising, right? We're not relying on anything, oh, because the Buddha said so, but rather, you know, knowing what it means to be a dependent arising, 
knowing the relationship between something being a dependent arising and that logically entailing that then a phenomena is empty of inherent existence, then just by the power of you know, that relationship, we come to understand the sprout being empty of inherent existence. Yes? Okay. Great. So that's the, um, uh, yeah, the way we, we, we do, we, we proceed with this, okay? And then some of those things that I described before, um, uh, yeah, here it says, right? Uh, His Holiness Son Gasso gives us a kind of way out, right? Only a person well-versed in logical reasoning could even follow the process, right? So uh, those of you, you know, uh, might be a little bit beginner. So if you don't understand all these things and all the terminology and all the logic, you know, slowly, slowly, as you become more well-versed in logical reasoning, then, uh, especially when you study the second chapter of the Pramanavartika, then uh, these things will become uh, a little bit more accessible. Okay? Terrific. Okay, so you see now uh, outline two, in particular, how to purify oneself of the four opponent powers. That's where we are. Okay? So here, um, uh, you'll see it translated these four opponent powers in different ways, right? So uh, the ones in uh, parentheses is a little bit easier, right? We have the four R's, you know, using a mnemonic device. Yes, you guys know this mnemonic device? So four R's, regret, remedy, resolve, and refuge. But uh, as it's translated here in the uh, liberation of the palm of your hand, it talks about the power of repudiation. And uh, that means basically, yeah, regretting, understanding uh, what we have done in the past and reflecting on the uh, various drawbacks of that. And uh, then, yeah, regretting. So here, uh, one thing to note is that it is, uh, you know, distinguished from mere uh, sort of guilt, right? So it's not just thinking, oh, I'm such a bad person, oh, right, uh, beating oneself up. But uh, rather, the, the analogy is to think of it like, uh, you know, how you would think if you were, you know, with two other people, you've all eaten a meal together. And then on the way home, uh, you know, one of your friends, right, uh, starts, you know, vomiting and dies. Your next friend also starts vomiting. Yeah. And, you know, you've eaten the same food. Right. So what would you do? You wouldn't think, oh, I'm such a bad person. I shouldn't have eaten that. But you would instead try to get to a hospital to get medical attention as soon as possible, right? Okay. So like that, uh, you know, the past is the past. We can't change the past. But what we can do is, you know, uh, uh, try to uh, sort of act differently in the future. Okay. And then... Um, we have the power of applying all antidotes, uh, otherwise known as the remedy. So uh, we'll get into this in a, a second. Um, well, let's get into it now. So uh, here in, in the Shantideva's Compendium of Trainings, there are six remedies that are listed depending on profound sutras. So uh, this is you know reciting sutras. By the way, a little bit of advertising. Uh, there's a session that's starting. Um, I was actually late last night. Anyway, I mentioned this, uh, this um, uh, session on the Golden Light Sutra. Okay. And so um, because it, it starts at noon Indian time, but actually Hawaii is a day earlier than India, I was like, oh, yeah, it's 8.30 today. Uh, I get a call at 8.30, and it's uh, Venerable Kunpen. I don't know if some of you know her from uh, Tushita Dharamsala. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, what's well, she's calling for? Oh, we're going to plan out tomorrow's session. She's like, you're on now. I'm like, what? So I'm like, you know, running all around. Anyway, it was a bit embarrassing. Anyway, that's happening at uh, 10.30 Pacific time. 
I know it's a little bit late, but uh, just a bit of advertising. Okay, so uh, we can recite sutras. Hmm? Uh, and then interest and emptiness means, uh, well, uh, of course, to meditate on emptiness, but it says, uh, like for example, in the Prajapadamita Sutras, even right with a mind of bodhicitta, we hear that a teaching on emptiness is taking place. If we take just seven steps toward the place where emptiness is being taught, it, it's like <laughs> so much more merit than I, I forget exactly what they say, but you know how they talk in the Prajapadamita Sutras, more merit than filling the whole. Uh, you know, a great thousand, uh, three thousand world system with the seven types of jewels and offering it to as many Buddhas as there are, uh, you know, uh, grains of sand in the river Ganges, you know, some um, immense amount of merit. That's just taking seven steps there. So uh, can you even imagine uh, to actually, uh, you know, um, hear the teaching of emptiness, reflect on the meaning of emptiness, uh, and yeah, realize emptiness, so much purification. Uh, then the dependence on recitation. So this is things like reciting a mantra, like the Vajrasattva mantra. Okay. Uh, so we'll get into that a little bit later when we talk about the, about the Vajrasattva practice. Uh, yeah. Then dependence on images. So this can be uh, making images of the, the Buddha. So there is also the preliminary practice of making satsas. You know, these little... I have some in the other room, a little kind of uh, plaster of Paris, um, you know, images of the Buddha. We can also do that by, you know, merely, oh, Mary Ellen has one there. Very nice. Is that uh, Arya Manjushri? Mm. So, yeah, uh, making images. Then uh, worship. Uh, here it's it's chapa actually so chapa is like lama chapa that means to make offerings and then dependence on names to recite the names of the buddhas like we do in the 35 buddhas practice uh, but these six they are the ones that are listed but as we mentioned i think uh, christine had a question about this in one of the earlier sessions uh, then this list of six is not exhaustive there are, uh, of course, any number of virtuous activities uh, we can do that will serve as an antidote for previously accumulated negative karma. Okay. Hmm. Oops. Okay, so that was number two. Number three, the power of refraining from the misdeed, that is the resolve. And this is the thought that uh, I won't engage in such negative actions again in the future. And uh, we'll see when we do it, then it's also a very skillful means uh, to set a kind of realistic goal that one can do for sure. So, um, and you know, they'll often say those negative actions that I find easy to refrain from, I will refrain from, but those negative actions that I find difficult to refrain from, I will for even a day, even for an hour, even for a few minutes, okay? Uh, then, you know, doing it in that way, uh, we can build up sort of momentum and, uh, you know, slowly uh, change and modify our behavior. So last, the power of the basis uh, is refuge. And uh, this is both going for refuge in the three jewels, as well as uh, generating bodhicitta. So um, normally they describe that, you know, since the negative actions that we've done are usually in relation to the, uh, well, they're always going to be in relation to either the three jewels of refuge or other sentient beings, then the, um, the negative actions we've done in relation to the three jewels of refuge, we can, you know, purify by going to refuge it means recommitting ourselves to train in the path of Dharma that the Buddha laid out. And then the, uh, uh, the practice of uh, generating bodhicitta, this altruistic wish to achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all sinning beings, then uh, you know, helps us to purify the negative actions accumulated in relation to those beings, okay? And so now here, after these little arrows, right, there is a presentation about uh, you know, 
how each of these four powers then purifies one of the uh, sort of ripening effects of our negative karma, right? So remember, we had these four ripening effects, right? So the power of repudiation, then that purifies the uh, causally concordant effect in terms of experience, right? So remember, then when we kill, then uh, we will be killed, right? Uh, the power of applying all antidotes purifies the fruitional effect. Fruitional effect is taking rebirth in one of the three realms, right? So that also kind of makes sense, right? Because when we do a virtuous action, then that will give us the uh, karmic cause to be reborn in a higher realm. Then the um, uh, power of refraining from the misdeed purifies the causally concordant effect in terms of action, right? That also makes sense because when we make the commitment, we have the mental energy behind, I'm not going to do that again in the future, then uh, you know this uh, causally concordant effect in terms of action is the tendency to do that action again in future lives, okay? And then the power of the basis uh, then purifies the environmental effects. Uh, so maybe that's a little bit less clear, but uh, we can think just off the top of my head, right? Uh, then in those areas, right, having gone for refuge, it would um, uh, increase our likelihood that we would be born in a, uh, a place where the Buddha's teachings uh, still exist. Uh, whereas in other lands where, you know, the Dharma is completely non-existent, then um, sometimes they, they translate it as the, the uh, barbarian lands, right? And uh, there in the commentaries, they describe these barbarian lands as where, you know, uh, there's you know, animal sacrifice and killing all the time. No one thinks that killing is a, a wrong thing. So, um, yeah, that can be uh, something. Um, yeah, one way that going for refuge can, um, you know, purify the environmental effects. But again, that's just my hypothesis. Okay. All right, so we are on schedule. I am going to stop that. Oops. And now another screen share. Oh no, this is the four, this is the larger stuff. Let me do the, the, the 35 Buddhas first. Okay, here we go. All right. <clears throat> so, um, by the way, this text is available through the uh, FPMT um, store. It's available uh, as a um, donation only basis. And so we will send you the, the link to that. Uh, but in any case, you should all have it. So uh, in any case, uh, just a little bit of uh, background about this practice. So uh, if I remember correctly, um, okay, this practice of uh, confession of a Bodhisattva's downfalls to the 35 Buddhas the um, it's actually a sutra. It's called the Sutra of the uh, Three Heaps, and the three heaps are like the three uh, sections of the practice. So we have the um, confession, the rejoicing, and the dedication. Okay. So the story of the history of the sutra is that uh, in the Buddha's time, there were some monks. And uh, there's, there's actually two ways this is described in the uh, commentaries I've read. Uh, one is these monks, while they're out on their begging uh, round, then uh, they caused um, someone's child uh, to die. It wasn't uh, their fault, right? They didn't uh, kill, but through some um, sort of accident, then uh, a child uh, died. And, uh, you know, they, they felt a tremendous remorse about this. They went back to the Buddha 
and uh, said, oh, well, what can we do uh, to help purify? And uh, the Buddha then taught this practice. So uh, in any case, um, these uh, 35 Buddhas, uh, so one thing to know is while one is uh, training on the path, and so all of you will also do this, one makes specific kinds of dedications that, uh, you know, when, for example, when I become enlightened, may I, and then these particular Buddhas say, said, okay, may I, uh, you know, anyone who says my name, right, anyone who does uh, practice in relation to me, may their negative karma be purified, right? Whereas, you know, the medicine Buddha, he made uh, special uh, prayers that, uh, you know, in the times of the generation, particularly, uh, may those who do my practice be able to, uh, you know, be cured and um, have success in their practice. Uh, so anyway, all the individual Buddhas have uh, different aspirational prayers that they make along the path. And then uh, through the, the power of collecting merit for, uh, you know, the, the time when they're on the Bodhisattva path, then when they become Buddhas, those prayers come to fruition. So uh, these 35 Buddhas made the uh, aspiration uh, to be particularly, um, yeah, to help sending beings purify their negative karma. So the, the motivation here uh, it says optional. Um, this probably, is, yeah, we can, when we go through it uh, this Saturday and next Tuesday, we can go through it in, in more detail. But for now, the point is, uh, you know, before we do any virtuous uh, deed or action activity, we should uh, reset our motivation. So this here is like a mini lemon meditation. And in particular, so that we get the a sense of regret for our previous, uh, previously accumulated negative uh, actions, then, well, here, uh, it, uh, Rinpoche has us, uh, you know, remind ourselves uh, how it would be to be reborn in the lower realms, okay? And uh, to make it real, to then reflect, you see here, I have created numberless causes to be reborn in the hell realms, right? And then going through the various, uh, you know, ten on virtuous actions, breaking the party moksha vow, breaking the bodhisattva vow, and tantric vow, and, uh, you know, going through the various uh, non-virtuous actions that we have done from beginningless time. Okay. And then uh, to go through these uh, different ripening results and then going through some of these uh, aspects that karma increases and so forth. Okay. So, uh, therefore, after reflecting all that, these features of karma, the fact that we're going to you know, be reborn in the lower realms, particularly the hell realm, because we've accumulated such negative karma in the past, then, uh, and especially because we're going to die and death can come in any moment, therefore, what's the solution? We need to purify, and therefore, we're going to do this confession of the Bodhisattva's downfalls. And then also, I'm going to do this so I can actualize the path and achieve full alignment for the benefit of all sentient beings. So, Bodhicitta, also the uh, power of the um, basis. Okay, so then uh, we have the visualization. So actually in this as well, there's a nice tanka. Okay, so this again, when you look in some of the other uh, commentaries, uh, so this is worth noting. Uh, Lam Sun Kappa, uh, I think I've, I've mentioned uh, many times how he was unsatisfied with his realization of emptiness. And uh, when he asked Manjushri for advice about how he could get a better understanding of emptiness, Manjushri uh, told him to uh, focus on purification and accumulation of merit. Uh, after which Lama Sunkhaba went into retreat with eight close disciples, <clears throat> which reminds me, the four great deeds of Sankapa. Remember, we, I only remember three last week. So I wonder, did any of you then research that? And you can tell me the fourth. Mary Ellen, golden star for you. <laughs> he founded uh, Camden Monastery. Uh, yes, but in particular, 
there is a, a, a kind of um, offering room at Ganden Monastery that has three dimensional representations of the mandalas of the three main uh, deities within the Galupa tradition. And that, that is the one actually that is kind of singled out. Uh, actually at, at uh, Gyume um, Tantra College in South India in Hunsur, they also have those uh, mandalas, three-dimensional mandalas. Okay, anyway, uh, so Lama Sankaba then, he uh, went to uh, Loka with eight uh, of his uh, kind of disciples and they engaged in a, uh, a long retreat. I think it was uh, three, four years of retreat during which time he did 3.5 million prostrations. Means, okay, so normally when we talk about the Nundral practice, they say 100,000 prostrations, right? So how does uh, Lama Sankaba think? Or how did he think? Okay, 100,000 sounds great. Let me do that for each of the 35 Buddhas, right? So rejoice, rejoice. Remember when we rejoice, we receive the same amount of merit as the original person doing it. So amazing. But then uh, as uh, he did the practice and he uh, got more and more purified, then he had a vision of the 35 Buddhas. Uh, it is said that actually at first, uh, we'll come to this in a bit, but at first, uh, you know, he didn't, uh, he saw them except for their heads. And um, well, in the uh, original wording of the sutra, you know, it, we'll get to this in a second, but it says, oh, actually, we'll get to it now. <laughs> okay. Yes, it's here. So you see this, uh, to Tathagata, right? To Tathagata, reading Jewel, I prostrate. Tathagata, King Lord, and Langas, I prostrate. Okay. So uh, in the beginning, there wasn't this Tathagata. Okay. Because the first one, Glorious Conqueror Shakyamuni, it had all of these epithets, right? Then the rest, it just said, you know, like, thoroughly to thoroughly destroying with Vajra essence, I prostrate. In the original words of the sutra, as it is found in, in the Kangyu. So then Sankaba had the idea that, oh, it must be a little bit disrespectful uh, just to kind of say their name without having this, this epithet. So this uh, adding the Tathagata before the name of the Buddha is a um, practice now in the Gilupa tradition. After he started doing that, then he saw the Buddhas, you know, with their heads. And then in some of the commentaries, it describes the actual, uh, you know, way that he saw them. And uh, there's sort of 35, yeah, distinct uh, sort of aspects. But here, uh, then this to make it easier uh, for us, <laughs> who might have more difficulty uh, visualizing, uh, then this is a kind of simplified visualization where we see, uh, you know, the, just so you guys know, in the top there, that's the Buddha Shakyamuni at his heart is uh, Avalokiteshvara. From his heart, you see these, you know, light rays radiating out here, Vajrasattva. This is uh, Mitrupa. Here is Namgyalma, not just for long life, but also very powerful for purification. And then this is uh, Kunrik, Kunrik, a, um, another deity, very profound for um, uh, purification and is a, a, actually a practice that's uh, very much emphasized in the Sakya tradition. And then we have these uh, rows of the, uh, the rest of the 35 Buddhas, okay? And here you'll see this, you see how uh, this particular Buddha has a white face? So this is King Lord of the Nagas. This is one thing that Lama Sankaba had a vision of that, you know, the body was a different color. 
sorry, than the face. And so that has been incorporated into the visualization, but the rest is just the, um, the so-called five Buddha families, the Buddha family of Akshobhya, blue in color, in the uh, earth-touching mudra. This, the family of Vairachana, Buddha Vairachana, in the teaching mudra. Third row, the Buddha family of Vatnasambhava, with uh, the mudra of granting sublime realizations. Next, the uh, Buddha Amitabha. So when I say that, it means these Buddhas are in aspect, the same aspect, means color and hand mudra as Buddha Amitabha. And then last, uh, uh, Ratnasambhava, Buddha Ratnasambhava at the end. And then the lower lowest row is the uh, medicine Buddhas. So here there's eight. Sometimes you'll uh, hear the seven medicine Buddhas. Uh, the difference is what? At the end here, that is Buddha Shakyamuni. Okay. So sometimes Buddha Shakyamuni is sort of included in the um, seven medicine Buddhas because he is the one who, uh, you know, taught that practice to us. Okay. Great. Anyway. Uh, if you're like myself and have difficulty visualizing, no problem, okay? Most important thing when we do the practice is just to have the sense that uh, one, uh, guru devotion. So think that my guru has come to this place in the aspect of these 35 confession Buddhas as well as the seven medicine Buddhas and has come here so I can purify. Okay. All right. So basically, that is what this is saying. But I thought it better to uh, yeah show you the picture because picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, and then uh, it's also very good to think that each one of these Buddhas is the embodiment of all the Buddhas, Dhamma, Sangha, and all the statutory scriptures of the three times in ten directions, whose essence is the Guru. Have complete, complete faith that each one has the power to purify all your negative karmas and obscurations collected from beginningless births. Uh, so you know this, right? The ten directions, you see it so much. What are the ten directions? So we have the four cardinal directions and then the four intermediate directions, and then above and below. But what that means is not everywhere, okay? It's not like if we say above and below, like somehow at this strange angle, we like we're not including some of those Buddhas. It's not that way. This is all the Buddhas in the whole universe, but they just, you know, say 10 directions, okay? So this is another important thing. Then we, when we do the practice, we imagine that we emanate numerous bodies and then these bodies are very large, covering every atom of the earth. So here there is the, um, the sutra that's um, cited in the Lamrim Chenmo, uh, where it talks about the benefit of the prostrations. And then it says that, you know, for each, the benefit of the prostration is such that for each atom that your body covers when you make a prostration, to the, uh, I mean, it says the, the golden Vajra base. Uh, think of it as like the center of the earth, okay? So for each atom your body covers, for that many eons, uh, you know, you will be reborn as a wheel-turning king, okay? So uh, not that we necessarily want to be reborn as a wheel-turning king, but um, it just shows, you know, a tremendous amount of merit. Okay, for each atom. And so, uh, as we also mm, I think I've mentioned before, the, the power of the, you know, actually arranged as well as mentally emanated offerings, right? So whether one makes the offering, you know, sort of physically, directly on your altar, you know, by laying out of flowers, lighting incense and so forth, or if one even imagines having done it, then the merit is the same. So similarly, although our bodies don't actually cover, 
cover every atom of the earth than to visualize it like so. And also to visualize numerous, you know, numberless bodies, uh, then uh, we get that much merit. Okay, and then, uh, yeah, there are these uh, kind of multiplying mantras when we do the actual practice uh, this Saturday, we'll go through that. In any case, yeah, these, this first one, uh, you know, multiplies the prostrations by 10 million. And then uh, this next one um, multiplies the benefits by uh, 1,000. Uh, not only that, I've read in uh, other commentaries that um, by doing this prostration, uh, sorry, this mantra with full length prostrations on a daily basis, one also accumulates the cause to realize emptiness in this life. So, yeah. Uh, then this one, uh, these next two have, um, have become reason, reasonably recently popular with Lamazov Rinpoche. I think he uh, fairly recently discovered a text where it talked about the benefits of these. And now he is, uh, you know, very much uh, emphasizing. So first, just this one about the, uh, you know, resetting the, the Buddha Shakyamuni's name. So that purifies 80,000 billion eons of negative karma, right? So in one commentary, right? And I think a commentary Rinpoche himself gave on the practice in the 1970s. <sighs> then uh, it was 10,000 eons, okay? And then later, uh, I think he found another commentary saying 80, thousand eons and then it was you know it keeps keeps going up so it's good <laughs> we get more benefit right and then this uh next mantra also we can do uh when we do uh prostrations as well as when we do circumambulations so just a bit of um hmm, yeah just something to share I had the good fortune to be with Lama Zobar Rinpoche a few years ago in uh, Bodh Gaya. I think uh, Shanti Yajnik was there as well. I don't see her on the call. Is she here? Did she come in late? Oh, she has. Okay. But, um, yeah. It's a nice story. I'm just going to take, give me one minute. So one very nice thing about being at uh, Root Institute Right, so it's in Bodh Gaya. Yeah, you guys all know Root Institute. You know Bodh Gaya, right? Bodh Gaya is this, the, the place where the Buddha was enlightened. It's where the Bodhi tree is, right? The very famous uh, Bodhi tree under which the, the Buddha sat and uh, you know uh, attained enlightenment. So now uh, it's a very special place in the world. Um, very holy place one of the four major uh, pilgrimage sites of uh, for Buddhists. And uh, what, makes, what makes it even more special is that it's very active, not just a, a kind of, um, you know, place where people go, you take a, a picture and then you leave, but actually surrounding the stupa, you'll see hundreds of people uh, trying to do this 100,000 uh, prostrations. And so especially in the winter, the whole grounds of the place is uh, sort of full. And you'll also see, you know, many people uh, doing circumambulation, uh, offering mandalas, uh, reciting sutra. It's, uh, you know, very alive with energy. And um, yeah, it's very nice. There are people who then sponsor um, breakfast for everyone because some people are getting up and they're, uh, you know, I think they open at maybe four in the morning five in the morning and people are up right when it opens to get on the prostration board, trying to get in their uh, thousand prostrations before breakfast. Anyway, like that. So um, yeah, I had the good fortune to be there when Rimpsha was there. And then uh, he was talking uh, about the benefits of this, this mantra. And what he would do, he would uh, do these two here. It says, four or five times, but he would actually recite a whole mala of this, 
you know. So of course, saying the Tibetan Lama Tumba Jordan the Dishin Shaba Jajan Bayana Bazobi Sangha Pea Gya Vishaka Tuba La Chazalo On the Mo Dashi Deka Tui Kala Savara Na Chaya Nama Paga Cha Suba Dashi Salva Papam Bishadani Soa Okay, doing that and then a whole mala of it. So, as they say, you know, be careful uh, who you choose as a guru because you're going to end up like them. So this is uh, one thing we can all emulate, a positive quality of our uh, uh, teacher. And why? Why would, you know, Rinpoche, Rinpoche be emphasizing? Well, it's because there's these five benefits of reciting this mantra. And then, having done that, each prostration or circumambulation you do becomes the same as having prostrated to or circumambulated all the three rare sublime ones with the Amasanga and all the other holy objects, statues, stupas, scriptures, and so forth of the 10 directions and three times. Okay. So you all remember the, the um, story of the, the man. Um, shoot, I forget his name. But in any case, this old man who, uh, you know, was criticized by his family, got very depressed, left his family uh, and tried to ordain. Shai Putra said, oh, uh, I don't see the roots of merit uh, for you to ordain. He got very uh, depressed and then tried to, you know, commit suicide. Uh, but then the Buddha saved him. And um, when the Buddha did that, he, he then said, yeah, uh, Shariputra is not omniscient like me, but I do see that you have the root of virtue to uh, become ordained. And it's uh, when one time when you were uh, reborn as a, a fly, you uh, followed a cow, uh, you know, a cow making, you know, dung around the stupa. And just doing that, you did one circumambulation of a stupa. And therefore, you have the, you know, merit to be ordained. And uh, later, uh, that, that um, man became an arhat, became liberated from that, you know, root of virtue of just circumambulating one suba. So now here, you can imagine, uh, you know, accumulating the merit of having uh, circumambulated all the, uh, you know, three jewels, as well as all the other holy objects of the ten directions and three times. Then, all your negative karmas collected from beginningless uh, rebirth are purified. You will quickly achieve full enlightenment. You will uh, not be harmed by enemies and interferers, and you'll be free of disease and spirit harms. Okay? Unbelievable. So, let's do that one. Okay? Uh, can I just, a little bit, um, mm, yeah, a little bit advertising, right? So, of course, it's best if you can do this uh, 35 Buddha practice every day. But at the very least, you know, sometimes uh, you know, when I get busy, then I try to at least do you know, six of, of these together. Okay. All right. So now we'll get to the actual uh, confession of downfalls. Uh, so here, uh, taking refuge. This is the uh, opponent power of uh, going for refuge. Hmm. Then the actual prostrations, the 35 Buddhas. So here it's important, right? Uh, so there's benefits of reciting the name. So we, uh, you know, get these benefits by reciting. Therefore, we have to do it out loud. And then as we prostrate, since a prostration, you know, a full length prostration will take longer than just a mere recitation. If we do again and again, we can sometimes get in, you know, saying the, the, the same Buddha's name three times, some of the sh shorter ones, maybe seven times while we do one prostration. Okay. So that's important. And then uh, what we'll do this weekend, you know, we'll have a uh, recording. Okay. And then uh, even if you're doing it with a recording and you don't have the names memorized, then you can still sort of follow after that. So, you know, uh, to Tathagata thoroughly destroying with Vajra essence. Okay. To Tathagata thoroughly destroying with Vajra essence. Tathagata thoroughly destroying with Vajra essence. You know, as many times as you can. This is another reason why Rinpoche is very um, much emphasizing the benefits 
of memorizing these 35 Buddha's names. Okay. So now in the traditional text, there is a presentation about the uh, benefits of reciting each of these Buddha's names individually. Okay. And there has been a few um, commentarial uh, traditions that have come up about this. All right. Uh, one comes from, uh, there was actually a commentary by Arya Nagarjuna about this. And then also the, uh, the great Indian master, uh, Atisha, uh, also um, wrote a commentary on this. And then there's also a, um, yeah, various commentaries written by uh, Tibetan masters. So uh, I now have a commentary by uh, Drakpa Shedrup, who's a great master from uh, Sarah May. Uh, I did a commentary on this a little, some months ago, uh, put on by the good folks in uh, at Root Institute, the one we were just talking about. And there I was kind of, you know, trying to do it all. I was like, okay, this commentary says this, this commentary says that. And I, I sort of, afterwards, I kind of had a fear that uh, it was too much for people and it confused them. So uh, in any case, just know the, um, the benefits are, are tremendous. And just to give a little kind of taste of, of what that would mean, uh, let's just go through a little bit, okay? Just based on one commentary, okay? So <clears throat> uh, here, this commentary by uh, Dr. Shedru, then um, it says that, uh, yeah, uh, prostrating and, and reciting the name of the uh, conqueror Shakyamuni, it purifies. 10,000 eons, okay? So this might be the same commentary, Rinpoche, you know, first used uh, way back in the, you know, 70s. Then uh, thirdly destroying with larger essence, uh, here uh, also 10,000. Uh, radiant jewel, also 10,000. So 10,000 eons. Then the question comes up, okay, well, what is this talk? What is an eon, okay? And so some of you who have, um, read the Sangata Sutra in the past, okay? Then um, the Bodhisattva uh, uh, Sarvashura, he asks the Buddha, uh, how much is the measure of an eon? And the, the Buddha gives a analogy as a response, he says, imagine if there uh, were a mountain, however many, uh, you know, paksha, uh, it's a kind of, unit of measurement. Anyway, very high mountain, okay? On the side of the very high mountain, then imagine someone builds a shack. And then every thousand years, uh, every thousand years that goes by, the person takes a, a piece of silk and rubs the peak of the mountain, okay? The once like that, okay? Then goes back to the shack. <laughs> it chills out for another thousand years and then, you know, okay? So imagine uh, how long it would take in that way for the mountain to completely erode. Okay. Okay. So still an eon would not have passed. Okay. A little bit unfathomable. So then when it says 10,000 eons, it means 10,000 of those. So very, very long period of time. So you can imagine, you know, even one of these negative karmas that we've accumulated can have us be reborn in the hell realms for countless eons. So now to be able to purify negative uh, actions accumulate over that long is so amazing, so tremendous. Okay. So next, uh, King Lord of the Nagas, uh, reciting his uh, holy name, then 1,000 eons, sorry, my phone is ringing. 
Okay. I was actually really lucky because usually I have my phone on silent. But last night, I, I heard the call from Kunpen. It was very, very faint. It was not even in the same room as I. And I was like, oh, what's that? And it was, it was Kunpen. Okay. So uh, let's see. Where were we? Okay. Uh, King Lord of the Magas, 1,000. Then Army of Heroes, uh, 1,000. Delighted Hero, 2,000. Uh, Jewel Fire, 2,000 eons. Um, the Jewel Moonlight, uh, 8,000. And then Meaningful to See. Here it says uh, uh, one eon. And then the uh, Jewel Moon, that purifies the uh, negative karma of the five uninterrupted actions. Okay, so uh, later you'll see in, in the, the end of the commentary, uh, this is stated in a footnote. So uh, actually, let's do the, the, the next one. Okay, stainless one, it says it, it purifies from the five nearing uninterrupted actions. Okay, got it? So let's go down to the, the footnote here because there's a comment I want to make about this. Yo, uh oh. Okay, here we go. Okay, here we go. Okay, so footnotes eight and nine. So the five heavy negative karmas uh, killing one's father, killing one's mother, killing an arhat, kissing, uh, causing disunity among the Sangha and causing a Buddha to bleed. Uh, so that means with malicious intent, okay, uh, are called, so the, the Tibetan is Sam Me, Sam Me Nga Nga, meaning five, and they're called without break because if this negative karma is accumulated, then immediately after death, without the break of another life, one is reborn in the lowest hot hell. You know, the eight hot hells. Number eight, the most unbearable one, which has the heaviest suffering. Okay. And then there's a five nearing heavy negative karmas, right, without break. And then uh, this is uh, committing incest with one's mother, who is an arhat. Okay. So this is according to the, the presentation in the Abhidhamma Kosha. Okay. So it has to be both one's mother and she's an arhat. Okay. Uh, then uh, killing a bodhisattva who is destined to become a Buddha in that very life. So um, actually, this I'm not sure about because, see, the Tibetan says, you know, uh, a bodhisattva uh, abiding in certainty. And in the, uh, the Abhidharma, uh, Kosha by Vasubandhu, then it says that it can be, uh, you know, a bodhisattva who is going to attain enlightenment within one, uh, I think, 100 eons. Okay. So, yeah. Then uh, killing a Hinayana ar Arya other than one abiding in the result of our hardship. So what does that mean? An Arya being is one who has a direct realization of emptiness, right? And then one abiding in the result of our hardship means an arhat, one who's already attained uh, liberation. So uh, even when one has a direct realization of emptiness, there's still some ways to traverse along the path to our hardship. And so that means, uh, yeah, one of those Arya beings who is not an arhat. Then uh, stealing the possessions of the Sangha. Uh, yeah. And more generally, uh, here in the commentary, it also says uh, stealing the possessions of the three jewels. Uh, so that also can mean, uh, you know, when there are offerings laid out, uh, sometimes you'll see on the altar in front of the Buddha. So those offerings are the uh, sort of possession of the Buddha. 
so then uh, stealing those um, would be considered one of these five nearing uh, heavy karmas. And then uh, destroying a stupa or monastery out of hatred. And there in, in the commentary, it also says uh, not just a stupa, but uh, any representation of the uh, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. So that could also be, you know, burning a Dharma text out of uh, hatred. Um, so that is the, the presentation in the Abhidharma uh, Kosha. In the uh, text, uh, how do you say, like, Sayangushi. Anyway, one text by um, uh, Asanga, Arya Asanga, then uh, he doesn't limit the nearing heavy uh, negative karmas to five, but actually says there can be, you know, an indeterminate amount. And so uh, in that, he also says, you know, committing a sexual misconduct with a, uh, a bhikshuni, a, uh, you know, fully ordained nun would also account. And then uh, he says, so killing an Arya Bodhisattva. So, um, yeah, an Arya Bodhisattva, not necessarily one destined to become Buddha in that life. And then, uh, yeah, like that. There's also a distinction when they talk about stealing the possessions of the Sangha. Uh, just so you know, then they make a distinction between stealing uh, like the food or something that, uh, you know, sustains life for them. Then if, if one does that, then it's, uh, you know, taking rebirth in, you know, the, the lowest, most suffering hell. But then stealing uh, other types of possessions, say, like the robes. Uh, then that would be a uh, sort of um, less uh, lesser hell, you know. So like that. Okay. Uh. Okay. So I think. Maybe due to time, we don't go through all the benefits of the names, but, um, oh yeah, why not? We have already started, right? So let's see, where were we? Okay, Water God, right? Oh no. Bestow with Courage. Okay, so Bestow with Courage. Uh, purifies the uh, negativities motivated by anger. Pure one, um, the the ones motivated by attachment. Bestow with purity. Um, another uh, fa um, ten thousand eons. Water god, uh, a thousand eons. Deity of the water god, 5,000 eons. Uh, glorious goodness, another 5,000 eons. Glorious sandalwood, 7,000 eons. Uh, infinite splendor, another 7,000 eons. Uh, glorious light is uh, one attains limitless benefit. Sorrowless glory, the negativities accumulated, un, uh, motivated by ignorance. Son of non craving, the negativities uh, sort of motivated by uh, um, imprints. So, I guess what that means is, you know, when we have a lot of imprints for a particular type of behavior, we do it sort of automatically. Uh, so, I think it's like that. Then, uh, glorious flower uh, purifies the negativities or the obscurations of the body. Pure light rays clearly known by play, the negativities of speech. Lotus light rays clearly known by play, the obscurations of the mind. Uh, glorious wealth. 
purifies the uh, negativities of um, stealing from the Sangha. Glorious mindfulness, uh, the negativities of deprecating, or we could say criticizing other, uh, other beings. Glorious name, widely renowned. Uh, purifies the uh, negativities motivated by pride. Uh, to the Tathagata, the king holding the victory banner of formless power, uh, then that. Um, oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. I, I, I missed one. Uh, glorious name, widely renowned, that, uh, that purifies the uh, negative actions done out of jealousy then the king holding the victory banner of foremost uh, power that purifies those done out of pride then uh what is one told us who's doing it um uh purifies the um uh how do you say Divisive speech. Uh, then, Glorious One Totally Subduing uh, purifies all afflictions. Our Lady Victorious Battle purifies the negativities of having uh, sort of uh, incited others to engage in negativities, asking them to do it. Glorious Transcendence Through Subduing. Uh, purifies the negativities of rejoicing in others' negativity. And then, uh, glorious. Oh, I, I, again, I've. Seen. Okay. Uh, hmm. There's one missing from this commentary. Uh, it then skips to uh, Jewel Lotus. Okay, wait, sorry. Glorious manifestations illuminating all is the purifies from rejoicing. Yes. Uh, glorious transcendence through subduing. That is from asking others to do negativity. I don't know if I skipped one. Okay. Anyway, also doing jewel lotus uh, purifies the negativities of abandoning the holy dharma. So remember in the very uh, uh, module three, when we're talking about the, the great misdeed of abandoning the Holy Dharma, you know, to say that this teaching was not meant for, uh, you know, us, it was meant for others, you know, deprecating the Dharma. And then this last one, Tathagata, our uh, perfectly complete Buddha, King of Lord of the Mountains, firmly seated on Jewel and Lotus, that is the purifies the negativities of uh, deprecating one's guru. Okay, <clears throat> so then uh, it is a common practice to then uh, do the prostrations to the seven medicine Buddhas at the end. <clears throat> so we also do that. And then there's the actual confession prayer. <clears throat> so here are the ones that we are, uh, you know, mm, uh, confessing to. So all you 35 Buddhas and medicine Buddhas and others, as many Tathagata Arhat perfectly completed Buddha Bhagavans as are abiding, living, and residing in all which is in the 10 directions, all you Buddha Bhagavans, please pay attention to me. Okay, so that is the uh, object to whom we are confessing. And then what are we confessing? In this life and all the states of rebirth in which I have circled in some sorrow from beginning of lives. So this is important, you know, so whether we remember it or not, whether we've, we think we've engaged in this kind of activity uh, or not. Uh, of course, since the beginning of this time, we've done everything under, under the sun. So, uh, yeah. Uh, but we should think in this way to be from beginning of this time till now. So whatever negative actions I've created, may those create or rejoice in the creation of, whatever possessions of holy object of offering, okay? So uh, that is, yeah. Uh, not only stupas, but, you know, statues or even, uh, you know, the Dharma texts, uh, possession of the Sangha or possession of the Sangha of the Ten Directions, 
So uh, Sangha, you know, as you know, or may know, it can refer to either an Arya being, so someone who has a, a direct realization of emptiness, or uh, sort of more commonly, it can refer to a community of at least uh, four monks, or four fully ordained monks. Hmm. Uh, whichever among the five heavy negative karmas without break I have done, cause of done and rejoice in doing of. Okay, so those we've gone over. Whichever the uh, 10 non virtuous paths of action I have engaged in, cause others to engage in and rejoice in engaging of. So we also saw that the other week 10 non virtues, right? Three of body, four of speech, and three of the mind. So whatever I've done, being obscured by these commas, that caused me to be born as a, a sinning being in the hell realm, in the animal realm, or in the preta realm, in an irreligious country as a barbarian, as long life God, with imperfect faculties, holding wrong views, or not being pleased with Buddha's descent. So this is also to help us uh, generate regret when we see that the uh, you know effects of these negative karmas. And as uh, I think some of you will notice, there are eight right here. So the eight freedoms and 10 endowments, the eight freedoms is to be free from these eight that are mentioned in this paragraph. Hmm? Okay. So now, in the presence of the Buddha Bhagavan, who are transcendental wisdom, who are eyes, who are witnesses, who are valid, who see them, conscious, I may and confess all these negative actions. I do not conceal them, nor hide them. And from now on in the future, I'll abstain and refrain from committing them again. So this last line here is the power of restraint. Okay. So that is the first heap. Remember we said this is the sutra of three heaps. That was the heap of confession. So now we're going into the next heap, the heap of rejoicing. So we're going to, um, uh, sorry. So it's rejoicing and dedicating. Okay. So uh, first we're going to identify the roots of virtue that we're dedicating. And as we do that, we'll rejoice in it. Okay. So all Buddha Bhagavan's please pay attention to me in this life and all the states of rebirth in which I've circled in some sorrow from beginningless lives. Whatever roots of virtue I've created by generosity, even as love is given one mouthful of food for being born in the animal realm. So these are going to go through the six perfections. Whatever roots of virtue I've created by guarding morality. Whatever roots of virtue I've created by following pure conduct. That means the practice of patience. Whatever roots of virtue I've created by fully ripening sending beings. So that is actually the uh, uh, included in the practice of uh, joyous perseverance. because. Uh, yeah, fully ripening sinny beings is hard work. You need a lot of perseverance to, you know, persevere over a long period of time. Then whatever roots of virtue I've created by generating bodhicitta, that is actually included in the um, perfection of concentration. Those of you who have studied the Bodhisattva Charyavatara, you'll know that those instructions on equalizing, changing self or others, where are they found? In what chapter? Chapter 8, the chapter on meditation. Okay, and whatever roots of virtue I've uh, created by my unsurpassed transcendental wisdom. Okay, so there you think of all those, right? So every virtue you have done, right, could be included in one of those practices. I mean, actually, to be one of the, the perfections, the full fledged perfection has to be done with bodhicitta, but here that's kind of you know implied. So even, right. The, the guarding morality that we didn't do necessarily with Bodhicitta, we still created roots of virtue of that. And now do, what do we do with that? So we rejoice about it. And then all these assemble and gather combined together, I fully dedicate to the unsurpassed and excel that higher than the higher, that superior to the superior. Thus I completely dedicate to the highest perfect and complete enlightenment. Just as the past Buddha Bhagavans have fully dedicated, just as the future Buddha Bhagavans will fully dedicate, and just the presently abiding Buddha Bhagavans are fully dedicating, like that too, I dedicate fully. Okay, so this is uh, you know very similar to what we see in the King of Prayers, where it says you know just like the uh, Arya Samadavajra and Manjushri too, dedicated the roots of virtue, so I too dedicate these merits for the Bodhisattva practice. Right, so uh, it's very skillful. It's like I like to say, right, when you go to a restaurant, right, and you don't know what to order but you see it at the other table, 
something kind of nice, you say, oh, okay, I'll have what he's having, right? You do that? Okay, so like that. We don't know how to do all these Bodhisattva aspirations. So instead we say, okay, so just as those past Buddha Bhagavans have dedicated their merits, okay, I dedicate like that. <laughs> I'll have what they're having, right? I order what they're ordering. Very skill. I can, so then it's just kind of then mm, summary, right? I confess all actions, uh, negative actions individually. I rejoice in all merits. I urge and request all Buddhas. So actually here, uh, one should know that um, these are the other limbs, right? Urge the Buddhas, uh, sort of beseech them to remain until the end of samsara and request that they uh, turn the wheel of Dharma. Then lastly, uh, may I achieve the supreme, holy, peerless, transcendental wisdom. That's the dedication. Okay. So there it's said in, in, in this commentary that the, the uh, limb of offering is sort of implied. When you do the prostration, of course, doing a prostration is sort of, you know, offering your um, kind of, uh, and resetting the names, offering sort of praise, offering your body as a kind of physical homage. So all the seven limbs are complete. Uh, to the conquerors, the best of humans, those who are living in the present time, those who have lived in the past, and those who will likewise come, all those whose qualities are vast in the ocean with hands full that approach for refuge. Uh, so then there is this general confession. Um, yeah, let's go through it. So at the beginning, woe is me, right? Woe is me, it's like, you know, say uh, domage, right? A kind of uh, expressing regret. Uh, now, uh, great Guru Vajradhar, all the other Buddhas and Bodhisattvas have been in the ten directions of all the venerable Sangha. Please pay attention to me. So, quite similar. I who am named, and then say your name, circling the cycle of existence from beginning of time to the present, overpowered by the delusions such as attachment, hatred, and ignorance by means of my body, speech, and mind. So, now here is very similar to what we just saw in the 35 Buddhas uh, confession, uh, but here it's a little bit a little bit more of an enumeration. So the more specific we can be in our enumeration of the non-virtues that we are, uh, are confessing, then the better and easier it is to generate the mind of regret. So here we have the five, uh, sorry, the 10 non-virtuous actions, committed the five heavy negative karmas without break, and uh, committed the five nearing heavy negative karmas without break. So those we all know. I've transgressed the vow of individual liberation, the Pratimoksha vows, of which there are eight, right? You have the, the uh, lay men's vows, the lay women vows, the uh, one day vows that are included in the uh, vows of individual liberation. And then we have five for ordained, the, um, the novice monks, novice nuns, and then there's what they call the probationary nun, and then the fully ordained monks and nuns, okay? Uh, transgress the vows of bodhisattvas, bodhisattva vows, transgress the samaya of secret mantra. So that's the Vajrayana. So now I've been disrespectful to my parents, disrespectful to my Vajra masters and my abbot, disrespectful to my spiritual friends living in ordination. So here, uh, you know, when we went through those other factors that make uh, karmas relatively heavy or light, then we saw that there was, you know, the, due to the power of the field, then karmas can become heavy or light. And of those fields, right, then there's a field of kindness, like our parents, hmm? uh, and also our teachers. And then uh, our spiritual friends living in ordination, those are also, you know, uh, the field of quality, the sangha, right? Uh, so those actions are singled out here because they're uh, heavy because of the object. I've committed actions harmful to the three rare sublime ones. That's the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Abandoned the Holy Dharma and criticized Arya Sangha, harmed sending beings, and so on. These and many other non virtuous actions I've done caused others to do, and rejoice in others doing, and so forth, in the presence of the great Guru Rajadhar, 
All the Buddhism boys have is your violent ten directions, and then the Sangha I admit this entire collection of false and transgressions that are obstacles to my own higher rebirth and liberation and causes of psychic existence and lower rebirths. I do not conceal them and I accept them as negative. I promise to refrain from doing these negative uh, these actions again in the future by confessing and acknowledging them, I'll attain abundant happiness while by not confessing and acknowledging them, true happiness will not come. So yeah, I think that's pretty understandable. Here we have the, the limb of restraint. Okay. And then here at the end, this is important that we do the visualization. And the essence here is that through doing this practice, then all the negative karma obscurations and imprints collected on our mental continuum from the beginning of the rebirths are completely purified. So here it's a bit of a dependent arising. The stronger the thought that you have that I'm completely purified, actually, the more purification takes place. And that's also very good. Uh, to then also meditate on emptiness. I must admit, I don't like this wording. In emptiness, there is no I, creative negative karma, no action of creating negative karma, and no negative karma created. What does that mean, in emptiness? Because remember, we have these two levels of truth, right? So, just like in the Heart Sutra, right? It says no ear, no, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. Okay. So what that means there is in the Aryas, you know, direct meditative equipoise on emptiness, then these things don't exist. Why is that? Because the Arya is meditative equipoise on emptiness. The only thing that is appearing is emptiness. And therefore, all the other conventional phenomena, right? Conventional phenomena like eyes, ears, noses, right? Those are conventional. Therefore, they don't appear to the Arya's meditative ego poison on emptiness. Okay. So similarly, here, I would prefer it to say in the Arya's meditative ego poison on emptiness, there is no I, no creator, right? All those things. So the trick is, what does that mean? Why do we care what's in the, the field of vision of an Arya's uh, meditative equal poise on emptiness? Well, the point is here, you see, if the nose, the tongue, the body and mind, whatever phenomena were truly existent, then it would be discovered by, it would be realized by the Arya's meditative equal poise on emptiness. Because that meditative equal poise is searching for true existence. If there is something as true existence, it would find it. You understand? But since it doesn't find it, it actually, since it's looking for true existence, it doesn't find anything, means there's no true existence. Okay. <laughs> means everything is empty. Okay. So this line here, what that means is the I the creator of negative karma, the action of creating negative karma, and the negative karma that has been created is empty of inherent existence. You understand? Otherwise, in my opinion, and you know, this is just me because I'm you know probably lower faculty, when I read this just as it is, I'm like, isn't this kind of Nihilism, like in emptiness, there is no I. What does that mean? Anyway, I get confused. Okay? You understand? So, of course, if you can read that and you're like spot on, you can understand what that means, you know, good on you. The point is meditate. We Here we're meditating on the so-called emptiness of the three spheres. The three spheres being the subject, right? The creator of negative karma, right? The action creating negative karma. And uh, we can say the, um, the kind of result of that, the negative karma uh, or the imprint of negative karma that is created. Those three are empty. Uh, then it's very good to uh, do this mantra of pure morality. Uh, 
Okay. And then this prayer. By the way, those of you who have taken uh, Mariana precepts, you should know if you, out of uh, you know, heedlessness, break one of the vows, then you recite this mantra three times and recite this prayer that is from the Maitreya prayer. Okay. That's the commentary on the 35 Buddhist practice. Okay. So as a commitment now, 3.5 million. No, I'm joking. Actually, in the course of, you know, the, the, the DB uh, program, we're all to do uh, 100,000 uh, prostrations. A question came up because someone has, uh, uh, you know, f physical difficulty through having had surgery in the past. And uh, we got in touch with the powers that be at FDMT International Office. And uh, the, we got the instruction, uh, you know, passed on uh, down the chain, right? That Rinpoche then said, you can recite uh, this practice 100,000 times. And while you do that, uh, do the appropriate visualizations. Okay. So. And then especially if you visualize, you know, numberless uh, bodies, each huge, like we talked about, <clears throat> then, you know, some of the people, if they're just not doing the visualization and only prostrating with one body, it could be the case that you're accumulating even more merit than they are. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I'm looking at my, my clock. And we have 17 minutes left. I also want to go through the uh, Vajrasava practice. So I'm going to do that in, in even less time than the, the record breaking commentary on the 35 Buddha practice. Okay. Oh, we have two hands up. Can, can we wait just a little, little bit? And then I'll get to you guys. <clears throat> okay. So this also. Uh, is available for download. So before the Saturday uh, retreat, mini retreat that we're going to have, uh, we'll make sure that you have all of these texts. Okay. So basically, right now, the format of all of these purification practices are the same, right? We're going to do the four opponent powers. So we're always going to visualize, we're always going to generate regret, we're always going to visualize the field of merit. By the way, what does field of merit mean? So those ones that we visualize in the space in front of us, okay, they are the so-called field of merit. Hmm. Now, what is the significance of, of uh, those words? So just like a field, hmm, you plant seeds, you get a crop, okay? Now here, uh, in relation to these Buddhas that we're visualizing in the space in front of us, then we're going to be doing prostrations. We're going to be making offerings. Okay. So in that field, what are we doing? We're not. We're not. You know, going to get a, a, a harvest of wheat later. We're going to get merit, right? So there, that's why it is called the field of merit. Okay. So anyway, there's the visualization. Okay. So now here also, objects of refuge. Okay, so here again, it's just it's just some uh, grammatical term that you know the Tibetans really like. Okay, we have the 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 chawa and the chawe yul. Yul means object, right? And so okay, we have just think about it like this: you're the subject, right? You're the actor. What are you What are you doing? What is your action? Going for refuge. So to whom are you going to refuge? The three jewels. So the object of refuge are the three jewels. Okay. And you visualize them in either of these ways, right? One into many, as in the Georgia, and then the big, like in the Lama Chippa merit field, right? You have Lama Sankaba in the, in the middle, all these, uh, you know, uh, lights radiating out and all the different Buddhas and uh, root and lineage gurus. Okay. Then the many into one. Uh, this is what. I like to do because it's uh, you know easier just to to one right Shakyamuni Buddha 
visualizing as having all the qualities of the Buddha Dharma Sangha. Then we have the power of reliance, taking refuge in genuine bodhicitta. This we know. Power of regret. This is very similar to what we've done, right? Okay. And then giving it a little bit extra urgency by remembering impermanence and death. Then a little bit extra bodhicitta, refresh that. Then the visualization of uh, Vajrasattva on our crown, feed, uh, facing the same way as we are. And then these, you know, various uh, kind of ornaments and their appearance. Yeah. Then the mantra recitation. <clears throat> so this is the, the remedy. So there's a visualization as we do this. The nectar is flowing through. There are, uh, you know, actually th three slash four ways you can visualize that. And then at the end, right, the power of restraint. And here is what we said, right? I vow never again to commit those negative actions from which I can easily abstain. And then those find it difficult to restrain, I will abstain for, and then some small amount. Then Vajrasattva says that we have been completely purified. And then Vajrasattva dissolves into us. We again meditate on emptiness. Here's that same <laughs> line. <laughs> okay. It could be the case that, you know, uh, I don't know, Rinpoche even said that before. If that's the case, you know, I'm not, I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying, you know, because that is rife for confusion, I wanted to sort of explain that. Okay. So it's not, it's not that there's a bad line, right? Because just like the, the, the Heart Sutra, it's confusion. It's confusing if you don't know what's going on. So similarly, it's the same. Okay. And then the dedications. Okay. So it's worth going through the uh, meaning then of the, the mantra. This is what I wanted to get to. Okay. So uh, here, it's not just some kind of random syllables, but it has actual meaning. So Om, qualities of the uh, Buddha's holy body, speech, and mind. Vajrasattva, being who has the wisdom of inseparable bliss and emptiness, which is a quality unique to the Buddha's. Samaya. Okay. Samaya, it means a word of uh, kind of commitment that must not be transgressed. And then Manupalaya, lead me along the path you took to enlightenment. Uh, Vajrasava uh, Tenopatita, make me abide close to uh, Vajrasava's Vajra holy mind. Jitu Mebhava, please grant me a stable realizations of ultimate nature of phenomena, it means emptiness. Uh, Sutakao Mebhava, Please grant me the blessings of being extremely pleased with me. Uh, super Kyle may have, uh, bless me with the nature of well-developed great bliss. Okay, so well-developed great bliss isn't just, you know, what we get from eating a nice uh, chocolate or something, right? But well-developed great bliss has the realization of emptiness. Anuratha may have, uh, please bless me, uh, bless me with the nature of the love that leads me to your state. Savasiddhi Maya Prayacha, grant me all, uh, all the powerful attainments. Uh, Savakama Sucha may grant all virtuous actions. Siddham Shidam Kuru, grant me your glorious qualities. Hum, Vajra Holy Mind. Ha ha ho, five transcendent wisdoms. I think we went over those before, but anyway. Um, there's, yeah, the five delusions transform into the five transcendent wisdoms of the Buddha. Uh, basically, it means the the omniscient mind of the Buddha. Okay, Bhagavan, one who has destroyed every obscuration, attain all realizations and pass beyond suffering. Sarva Tathagata, right? Sarva is all. Tathagata is, you know, the, the Buddha. Uh, and Vajra, yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, knowing things as they are, it also has a, a connotation of being uh, indestructible, unchanging. So those who have realized, uh, you know, emptiness, those who have uh, become Buddhas, they are, you know, never going to fall away from that realization. Uh, Mame Munsa, do not abandon me. Uh, Vajri Bhava, the nature of intractable separability. Ma Samaya Sattva, the great being who has the Samaya, the great, uh, the Vajra Holy Mind. Ah, uh, Holy Speech. Hung, transcendental wisdom, great bliss. Pei, clarifying transcendental wisdom of inseparable bliss and emptiness, destroying the dualistic mind 
that obscures this attainment. So then if we put it into prose with mantra, you advise yourself to journey of the holy mind of Bodhicitta according to your Samaya. Your holy mind is enriched with the simultaneously born holy action of liberating transmigratory beings from samsara. Whatever happen, happiness and suffering, good and bad happen to me by my pleasing the holy mind, never give me up and guide me. Please stabilize the realizations of the paths and boomies, boomies, right? The, the stages, right? Uh, including the happiness of the upper realms, actualize all actions and the common and sublime realizations and make the glory of the five wisdoms abide in my heart. That's the Vajrasafa commentary. Anyway, we're going to do this uh, four times, okay? At least together. So we're going to do, you know, two sessions on Saturday where we're going to have a combined session of the 35 Buddhas and then Vajrasafa. We're going to do that uh, once, have a little break, do it again. And then next uh, Tuesday, we'll do it uh, in person. Okay, so uh, that's that for now. Are there any questions? We had two. Mary Ellen and Eve, I saw your hands up. So you can go first. Yes. Eve, why don't you go? Okay. Um, I, it might be what we're doing on Saturday, but I feel like I need to hear some of these mantras. And I know that um, some of them are available on FBMT. However, I've when I listen to them, they really don't, they're not spoken at an instructive level, if you know what I mean, not slow enough, not clear enough for me. Um, and maybe not right now, but can we learn them as far as the pronunciation? Yes. We can. Good. Yes, we will. Mary Ellen? I have two quick questions. When you were talking about the five types of vows, you said lay men, lay women, one day vows, novice monk and nun, fully ordained monk and nun. Is there a difference between lay men and lay women's vows? Because I know with the monk and nun vows, there's different. Uh, no, there's no difference. Okay, good. But they're, yeah. they're enumerated in that way. Yeah. Okay. The second question was after well, the Oma Mugashila mantra of pure morality. And then mm -hmm. that little prayer. I heard a commentary once that it's not, a, it's not sufficient to do that because that Mugashila mantra will purify whatever action you did, but the actual breaking of the vow that you took requires purification at the same time. So it's not complete unless you do the Vajrasattva mantra after. So you do Oma Mogashila, then you said a little prayer and then, is that is that your understanding? Because well, this is, this, is actually, yeah. this is actually what came up in that confusing passage of, in the liberation of the palm of your hand where they drew a distinction in the Sojong practice, right? We had the purification and rest restoration. Right. And um, uh, you, you remember that, right? In the last session where, you know, then that prompted the question from Eve, like, oh, this is so confusing. Anyway, and I made the distinction. There's things you do to restore a broken vow. And then there's, you know, the purifying the, the negativity. So here, uh, I'm not seeing that explanation that you just mentioned, Mary Ellen. But if that is the case, what that would mean is, the uh, Om Amaga Shila Mantra then restores the broken vow, right? Then you have to do an, another practice in, incorporating all the four opponent powers to purify. Okay, so you still have to, to do both. <clears throat> Christine. Yeah, so the, um, the question we have is, uh, we were just reflecting earlier on karma, um, Past bad karma is part of why people might experience suffering in this lifetime or if something bad happens to you. But the, the issue that really struck uh, was with this war in the Ukraine where 
lot thousands and thousands of people are being having suffering and it just seems random and it's hard to say okay all of them had bad karma in past lives and they all happen to be in the right area so it just made me question the whole like bad things happening associated with karma and it also implies predestination right it also implies that all of these people had to be in the ukraine to be bombed right that was predetermined by their bad karma so how should we think about that okay so the the first point is a little bit easier <laughs> to to say um so remember you know when we talk about uh you can either do the action yourself ask someone else to do it or rejoice in someone else doing it right so you could imagine okay let's just imagine how uh you know now it's like millions of people uh, experiencing a kind of similar thing. So one one thing could be, you can imagine, if one's country does go to war with another nation and you, uh, you know, totally decimate the other opponent's army, you win the war. Then all the, you know, 45 million people of that country are like, yeah, we killed all them, right? They all get the negative karma of having killed however many their army killed, okay? Okay, so just just in general, how how you can think of, uh, you know, millions of of people experiencing kind of same karmic thing, it can happen like that. In in the 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 sutra, in in the, sorry, in the liberation of Palmyrhana talks about uh, stories like this. Okay, now second question. This is uh, more difficult. I don't think it <clears throat> it implies you know uh, predetermined or you know so, some kind of pre destined outcome um but rather you know we all have uh, so many different uh karmic imprints in our mental continuum because we've been accumulating them since the beginning of this time but for those imprints to awaken we also need to uh you know come with the um uh sort of cooperative condition that's going to happen in the moment right so uh probably all of us have the um the karma to have our uh, cities bombed to become uh you know war refugees all of us whether we're whatever country we're in um but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's it's going to happen i mean let's 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 take it a little bit easier right we all have the karma to be murdered okay that's not necessarily going to happen. Okay. Um, if, and sorry, it's going to get dark, right? If, and, and as they say, God forbid, right? Some of us does get murdered. It wasn't necessarily the case that it was predestined when we were born that we would then get murdered in this life. You know, there would be other more proximate uh, factors that came up. So anyway, yeah, like that. Okay. Okay. Basic point, karma does not mean predetermination. Okay? okay. It is one of just many causes and conditions that need to be there for something to happen. Mm -hmm. But even if the karma is there, it doesn't mean the, um, the result is going to happen because mm -hmm. we do 35 Buddhist practice. That's right. That's right. Okay. Right. Okay, Mary. Hi. So, what is the mudra that goes with confession if you're not doing the actual prostrations? Okay. Thanks. S same one that we do, you know, when, when we do the, the four parts. By the way, on Saturday, I'm going to go through the, the physical, you know, moves of this too. Okay. Okay, so uh, yes. Sorry, um, no for, any, for anybody that doesn't know, could you explain the significance of the fingers inside? Uh, yes, I, I was going to do that on Saturday oh, sorry. because I'm, I'm, I'm seeing our time is up and I want to be very good about that. Um, so all those, those physical uh, things and, and you know the significance of everything and why we touch different parts, I'll, I'll explain on Saturday.
there was also some questions that came in through email and uh, some who is not with us. I had actually even put it onto a slide and I was gonna answer it, but uh, I saw that he had to go. So that gets me a little bit off the hook. I will answer this question another time. Maybe in the break time in the next uh, you know, two kind of retreat sessions we have. But for now, uh, let's call it a, 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 an evening because we have, uh, yeah, in, in uh, 90 minutes, the Golden Light Suture recitation. We means me and whoever else wants to come. So let's just do a, a brief dedication and then we can break. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> may whatever virtue I've collected benefit the teachings and all transmigratory beings and especially may cause the essence of perfect pure loves on Drakpa's teaching to shine forever. So, of course, let's also dedicate for uh, all sinning beings in the world uh, to generate the mind of Bodhicitta. And especially as Lama Zobar Rinpoche likes to say, especially all the world leaders, and maybe especially Van, Van Vladimir Putin, may all everyone generate the mind of Bodhicitta. And then, having generated the mind of Bodhicitta, may all of their actions only be motivated by the wish to cause you know, all sinning beings to be free from suffering and thus may their actions never do even the slightest harm to any other sinning being and only be of the utmost benefit to them. So thank you very much. We will send out uh, the details of the upcoming programs. And yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. <laughs>